Thanks for tuning into Community Inroads Watch for the Helpers series. Our topic today is health inequalities as it relates to access to healthy food. With us today to address this topic are three, I'm going to say three phenomenal local leaders. Vilma Martinez Dominguez, Leslie Melendez, and Representative Christina Minicucci. I'm going to ask the three of you if you could just very briefly, with a few sentences, introduce yourselves with your name, uh, your organization, just a couple of sentences, and then I'm going to I'm going to loop back to you. So, uh, Representative Minicucci, can we start with you? Hi, thank you, Joan. Um, I'm Christina Minicucci, and I'm the state representative from North Andover, and I represent. Lawrence, Methuen, and Haverhill also. Um, and I'm excited to be here. Talk about food, because I love food. Yes, me too. That's one of many things that we have in common, Christina. And Leslie? Hi, Joan. Thank you. My name is Leslie Melendez, and I'm the deputy director at Groundwork Lawrence. Um, and I see all of, I, I oversee all of the programming. Um, and food is at the top of the, of the list. And uh, I too love food. And I think we all need food in order to survive, especially healthy food. Now, here is another special lady, Vilma, who I keep wanting to say Vilma Laura. So I think I'm doing pretty well so far, right? Life is better as Martinez Dominguez, but it's easier to say as Vilma Laura. So can you introduce yourself, Vilma? Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Happy to be here. My name is Wilma Martinez Dominguez. I am the Community Development Director for the City of Lawrence. Basically, within Community Development, we aim to uh, improve the physical environment and uh, quality of life of our city. And we do that through a variety of uh, things, of programs, uh, many to create and preserve housing, the built environment, and our Mayor's Health Task Force, Parks and Open Spaces, Homelessness, and Economic Development. So a little bit of everything. And food is at the top of the list. And food is at the top of the list. And it's not just a little bit of everything. It's a lot of everything. It's amazing that you guys have any time to be visiting with me today. So I really appreciate it. Vilma, I'm going to start this conversation with you. Um, there is clearly no debating that people of color are being impacted far more severely by the COVID virus than their white brothers and sisters. And one of the initiatives started by the Mayor's Health Task Force, which you have been very involved with from the day I met you, um, along with, um, I believe, Lawrence General Hospital is to, to, in order to address this issue in Lawrence, is a program called uh, the Healthy on the Block Program. And I'm wondering if you could just talk about why this was started and basically what it involves. Sure, so we all know that our health is shaped by the conditions where we live, right? And so as, an, as a poor community with many challenges, food and being a food desert, it's one of the issues that we battle. Uh, and with the COVID, it's sort of become more uh, prevalent, more present. Uh, we thought about this uh, Healthy in the Block Bodega uh, Saludables project back in the 90s, actually, when we were doing some work around diabetes and diabetes prevention. And um, in 2010, if you think about it, uh, there was this horrible report that came out uh, where they did conducted this study uh, across 80 school districts and found that Lawrence was, had the, the most obese children. And so we sort of organized within the Mayor's Health Task Force and what it's called today, the Healthy Act Living Working Group, sort of started to look at chronic illnesses, uh, how they were impacting all of us. We, you know, that was further corroborated by uh, community health needs assessments from the hospitals and the clinic. Uh, we knew that the city, it's about 80% of the cities, it's located within a food desert, meaning that the access to food and healthy foods, is, it's very difficult. Uh, we also had one supermarket within city limits at that point, and now we have three, we're very lucky. But we also knew that bodegas uh, abound. So we had about, uh, we have over 86 bodegas in our city. So why not start looking that way to support small businesses while increasing the, the uh, uh, access to healthier food options? Uh, this was part of the salsa campaign supporting active lifestyles for all and it's kicked off with a resolution a healthy active living resolution where we actually worked the board of health and the administration and the mayor's health task force and partners just to make sure that there was a commitment to address the issues around health inequities uh, within our city and so the bodega project was one of those so when uh, lawrence general hospital uh, uh, did the construction for the surgical suite 5% of the capital's uh, monies have to go towards community health initiatives. So 
when those $2.5 million came, uh, became available, we had sort of the infrastructure and a, and a strategy and an initiative just to kick off. And so today we have about 26 plus uh, bodegas, uh, corner stores who are part of this effort. And so I, I'm just gonna push back a little bit because I don't know if everyone in North Andover um, has had the wonderful opportunity to, to even know what a bodega is and how important it is in the lives of the people of our, of our city of, of Lawrence. So, you know, and you can all jump in and, and talk about that because it's, it's really a focal point um, because there are a lack of, as you said, supermarkets like Market Basket. And I think there's a Market Basket on one end of town, a Market Basket on the other, and there may be one in between that's uh, not a market basket, but that's it, you know, for the entire city. So I'll, I'll let you speak. So bodegas are really uh, corner stores. It's, they're very traditional. They're, they are not just a place where you go and buy your staples, your daily, you know, um, items, but it's also a place where you socialize. It's a place where you, where you network. Uh, and it's, it's sort of a one place, uh, one stop shop, right? So you can get cooked food and you can get all of your regular items and you can get also items for our own, from our own countries uh, that are sold there. So bodegas are an important place for us. And actually there's only one market basket within city limits. The other two are in Methuen and in yeah. We do have America, uh, America food, America's food basket, I believe. Yes. And we have La Fruteria, which has sort of increased to that level. But um, I'll let others chip in about bodegas. <laughs> Well, I mean, to just to add to that, you know, they are the, the centerpiece of a neighborhood. Um, everyone knows the owner of the bodega. Everyone knows um, the, the workers that are there. Um, you walk in, everyone knows you by name. It's kind of like the cheers of Boston, right? Like everybody knows everybody. And it really is a place where um, folks feel comfortable and safe and they're able to get the things that they need to get. They understand that it's more expensive than going to the market. But if you look at the overall, you know, um, cost of what you get at the bodega versus going to market basket, if you don't have a car, if you don't have, you know, your own transportation, you have to pay for a cab, you have to pay for public transportation. And depending on what you choose, then you're also limited as to what you can bring in those spaces as well to get back. So the bodegas are definitely that staple in the, in the neighborhoods that um, kind of binds the entire neighborhood together. Mm -hmm. And it feels like a family when you go in there. I have to say, um, a number of years ago, I, I get very quick low blood sugar and I needed something to eat really quickly. And I pulled to the side of the road in front of uh, Bonanza. Do you know where that, the Bonanza bodega? And I walked in and saw that they served food in the back. And I, I don't speak Spanish well. And I there was only one person there who spoke English, but the lady in the back could just see my face. It was probably turning white. And she gave me, I, I said, I, I can't uh, speak much Spanish. I don't know what to offer. I don't eat meat. And she loaded me up with this huge plate of food, like a, like a family member, right? Like, you know, eat, eat, eat. And I think the whole thing must have cost three bucks. And she she wanted to watch me eat that until the color came back to my face. It, it was, it really was a wonderful experience. And that's what a bodega is. It's a, a very caring central part of the, of the community. So that's where a lot of our folks from Lawrence go to mm -hmm. shop, right? And there, you know, there, there's the cost of refrigeration. And so now we need to talk about the importance of the healthy on the block and how to help the bodegas. If we could just, just talk a little bit more about that, uh, Vilma, about what the healthy on the block program is sure. doing for the, for the community and the bodegas. At the point where we started this program, we were looking at, do we actually advocate for another supermarket within city limits? And we said, no, I think we need to build on the cultural aspects of the bodega. And I think we need to invest in our small businesses. And so it was a great opportunity and it's a friendly place, as you mentioned. So uh, what it did immediately was two things. Number one, increase access to healthier food options, but number two, really create opportunities, both for the bodega owners, the business owners, and the families that live in those neighborhoods. So it's a quick way, a nice way to address health inequities. Um, 
in, in, in addition to this, I think that the component of this um, Healthy on the Block is the technical assistance aspect of it. So with a commitment of 12 months of being working with us, in exchange, you can get a series of uh, technical assistance that sometimes our bodegas are not, bodega owners are not at a place where they can actually, you know, get into a, a, a expand their business or get a, a, a larger loan or they're very sometimes they're very basic they um, their the needs could be anywhere from accounting to inventory and things like that so it's a nice way for us to prep them to the, get to the next step and then they also get an incentive of a thousand dollars that could be invested in anything that we could help access you know uh, create that access for their families um, so they get that they get that partnership between public and private you know I, I don't think that we can do any of this work alone so you have you know they the small business owners working with a city government working with nonprofits working with youth working with researchers working with um, a CDFI you know such as um, Mill Cities community investment. And I think the other piece is just that it celebrates, right? It celebrates who we are, our cultural aspects, while still doing meeting all these other things. So you cannot get, health is in all policies. You cannot really separate it from community development or economic development or planning or a healthy food access. Not all of it has to be uh, working in collaboration. So I think that those are the many benefits of the bodega, of the healthy food block. Mm -hmm. And then Graham Work Lawrence um, and Leslie Melendez, you want to talk a little bit about your role in actually implementing this concept that did it probably come mainly from you, Vilma? You're not going to say yes, but nope, it was a collaboration. <laughs> not a collaboration. That's what you always say, right? <laughs> and you know, she does always say that, but in um, in in the true spirit of who we are here in Lawrence, um, it really was a, a partnership and a collaboration. It was a conversation that started happening at the Mayor's Health Task Force um, and who could help assist in, in implementing the programming. Um, the Mayor's Health Task Force is really focused on the policies um, and the system changes and Groundwork Lawrence was able to step in to support the implementation of the program. So we have, um, you know, a program manager who is one of the people, like she knows everybody in Lawrence, she knows every nook and cranny of the city. And it was, she was instrumental in being able to recruit um, the various bodegas and keep, keep them interested in the program and keep them a, a part of the program. And even after their 12 months was over, still kept them, kept in touch with them and kept um, working with them on various issues. One of the things that we learned very quickly, um, just to reiterate what Vilma said when we started implementation was that a lot of what the bodegas needed was that technical assistance aspect. It was having access to an accountant who spoke the language. Um, it was learning about the various ways to do inventory, to be able to capture their losses. It was you know, just having, how do you set up a bookkeeping system? So it was really basic things. You know, How do you set up a line of credit? How do you build your credit because we know that there were a lot of owners that were new to this country and didn't know how to do those things. So having someone um, like Maria Natera, who is the program manager, um, assist folks in, in those things was really imperative because she spoke the language and she was able to cross back and forth between you know the, the folks that were offering the assistance and the folks that were actually in need of the assistance. Um, and then towards the end of the programming, we offered a series of uh, workshops for the bodega owners. Um, and they got certified by MC, um, Mill Cities Community Investment, the CDFI, um, as having uh, their bookkeeping um, all in order. So they were able to access that and get an additional incentive for that. Um, and we're still hearing from folks. We still, you know, although the program technically is over, um, it's not really ever over. Mm -hmm. um, so we still we're still in touch with the owners that we um, partnered with. We hear from folks all the time saying, "Hey, you still doing that program? We'd really like to join." Um, and all of that ties into being able to fund the program, um, and and you know, looking for the future, looking towards what is next, and how do we evolve, and how do we make this into something that is more regional? Um, because we all know that you know these issues do not stop at municipal borders, right? They don't. We have folks that are moving out of Lawrence into Andover, into North Andover, Methuen, Haverhill. Um, so we're looking at that. We're looking at what would that look like? What is the possibility for expansion? Is there a need in those communities for this type of support? Um, so we've been very fortunate that we were able to 
get funding um, through an earmark from the state legislator to be able to look at that. Um, we've done some initial surveying, we've done some initial mapping, um, and, and there are some really great possibilities for expansion into the region rather than just here and to continue the work here in Lawrence because as Vilma said, there's over 80 bodegas in the city. And one of the things we see is that the change, the change in ownership happens and people, although they weren't part of the program before, now that they're owners of a new space, they wanna be a part of the program again. So um, definitely keeping our eyes open towards those partnerships that will help us fund um, the regional expansion of the program and continue funding it here in Lawrence. So Vilma and Leslie, where did they get that? Where does the technical assistance come from? The, the, where do you reach out to get the technical assistance? Is it from within your organizations or do you reach out to the community? So it's a partnership. Um, there are, you know, from the Groundwork Lawrence side, there are things that we have done to help support the technical assistance. But in terms of the work with the bookkeeping and creating business plans and creating marketing plans, our partners over at Mill City Community um, Investment have been key in helping us do this work. Um, and they are they have been the providers of the majority of the technical assistance. Got it. And um, Representative Minacucci, you do not need to be muted. We because we want to make this. A I'm just, you know, I'm just afraid of noises coming from the. I school. know, <laughs> but, but this is not a group to be muted. You're mm -hmm. you are a great proponent of this program, and you were the one who was talking to me about this a uh, couple of weeks ago. And um, Leslie, you said that one of our legislators had helped to get some money for the program. Who do you know who that person might have been? That was a couple of years back. Oh, I so. thought that was you. I'm sorry. Well, no, it, it, we, we are constantly finding ways to expand all of these programs. So, um, but this is it, what I love so much about this program is that it, it is not just a silo. So much of what we do is we take money and we put it into one organization and it's just a silo. They, it doesn't go farther than that organization or the small amount of things that they their focus area. And what this program does is it helps small businesses, which are really the engine of our community. So, so many after the gas explosion, when we realized in the impacted area, there were over 800 businesses that were impacted. And that's a huge number. And so when you think about there's 80 some odd bodegas in Lawrence and and that's where people are getting their food. So this is money that's going into a program to support that small business. So those are people living in our community also, right? And putting their money back into the community. Plus you're helping people access healthy food, which they need to improve health outcomes. So it kind of all of these multiple layers. Um, so I like, I love anything, any, um, proposals like this, I guess, or investing in proposals like this that allow us to put tentacles sort of areas, um, not just siloing, um, to get more bang for our buck, I guess. <laughs> yep. Um, you know, one of the things that I, when you drive through Lawrence again and you see these bodegas, um, now what I see are fresh vegetables and fruit oftentimes in the front of the store, which is not only beautiful, but that's healthy food. And I'm assuming that that is all part of the Healthy on the Block program, correct? Yes. One of the things that, I mean, there's so many benefits. There are the intended benefits, but we want them to be more aware of the importance of, you know, product placement. And no, we don't present it so much that this is, you know, healthier options, but rather, you know what, this is something that we're trying to do within our community. And if you can't, we can help you place your products in a way that it's going to increase sales and it's going to be more attractive. We also create like healthy aisles. So we have signage. So see, if you see that Apple, that salsa logo in a door or hanging up in, a, in an aisle, you know that we have been, we have touched that bodega, that corner store. And there is a reason why we, the city, as a city, we didn't want to do that. We know that doing programming is very difficult for a city, number one. And number two, um, we didn't want to be the first face that the bodega owners see. Because sometimes the city, it's, it's associated with enforcement. We wanted the bodega to see a nonprofit, a partner, somebody that they know, put a face in, you know, in, into that, and then uh, build relationships. Because I think that's how it has worked. Uh, we have had bodegas in downtown that have been that have participated in our ciclovia. That was purposely 
uh, we did that in par on purpose so that the bodega can be exposed. People learn about the salsa logo, the salsa logo is Paolo Ciclovia, and they understand sort of the whole message. Salsa could be food and salsa's movement. That's what we wanted to do with this. But it also, these efforts have led to other things. So we have been evolving. We started with assessment and then, you know, started this project. And now we're an age-friendly community where we're looking at nine different domains because we know and understand that by 2035, I believe the majority of the population is gonna be 65 and older. And so how do we do a food that food assessment that Les is talking about, it's part of those efforts. How do we prepare to have a space in all aspects, transportation, housing and food access, uh, immigration, that it's, it's really encompassing, inclusive, diverse and welcomes people of all ages. And so we have gotten funding to do some of that work. Um, Department of Public Health has looked at us and there's a mass in motion uh, municipal leadership and wellness initiative that we've had funds for, I wanna say probably eight years already that really looks at policies because really policies are the, 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 the things that shape opportunity for communities, right? They are the ones who create this sort of automatic, de, you know, de facto, you know, uh, uh, opportunities for people. So that one is looking at, at definitely policies. How can we change systems and policies and the environment so that everybody understands and everybody has access, equal access to um, healthy food? So I think that this has been a really amazing program. At the beginning, there was a lot of pushback because it is a very, um, it's a very comprehensive program and it's not a very easy program to implement. I mean, there's that cultural aspects. People are trying to, you know, survive their businesses. I know that Leslie can speak to some of the challenges that we, we have seen in, uh, in delivering some of this uh, technical assistance. So, uh, but we, we believed in it and we wanted to make sure that we continue to grow it and, and it's modeled. And now we would like to expand it, like Leslie mentioned, to a more regionalized. Effort. You, you know, one of the entities that um, is absent on the show is a bodega owner, because I would venture to guess that they would be talking about uh, in, in very laudable terms, the success of this program, not only in terms of helping with the health aspect of our community of Lawrence, but um, their own businesses. And from what I understand, it's really created a collaborative approach among mm -hmm. the bodegas. But I'll let, I'll let you guys talk about that. Absolutely. I mean, the collaboration that has come out of this has been, it's, it's a really beautiful sight to see. Um, you know, this work can't happen without collaboration. So having the municipality, having the state government, having nonprofits, having business owners all working together to move this forward has been a real um, amazing experience. Um, and it's given us a lot of food for thought. You know, there's been a lot of lessons learned as Vilma has, you know, alluded to, there have been challenges along the way. Um, the biggest challenge is getting, being able to get the bodega owner to come to a workshop. Mm -hmm. um, they're usually the only person that's running the store for 12, 16 hours, whatever their day is. So it's really difficult to get them out of the store to be able to participate. So we really had to um, find ways to be able to deliver the program in a way that was useful for the, for the bodega owners, not just we're checking off boxes, right? There had to be that usefulness. One of the big things that came out of this that wasn't expected um, that we're all very proud of is that there, this collaboration um, brought forth a distribution stream for bodega owners. You know, you can't get the same value of buying fresh produce as larger supermarkets do, right? You buy in bulk volume, you get bulk pricing. For smaller store owners, you can't buy in bulk because things go bad. Um, and what happened was we were able to connect one of our champions of the program um, the owner of Medio Market and a local farmer um, out of uh, Groton, and they partnered up. And so this bodega owner then created a warehouse near his store with refrigeration, and he purchases in bulk and then sells it to the smaller businesses um, mm -hmm. that can't do the bulk purchase. Mm -hmm. And it was we when we realized that this was the potential for this was there, and all the parties wanted it it was like okay so let's do this so again this you know the collaboration between the various partners and between the various participants gave us this additional benefit 
um, that we weren't anticipating and that has become its own distribution stream. They're doing their own thing. It has nothing to do with the program itself other than it got started with the participants from the program and they're running it, they're doing their own thing with it. And it, it allows a local farmer to partner with local businesses to get local food into folks' hands. And local is the way of the future, I'm hoping. Hey, Christina, what do you think about, I'm just assuming you were talking about Farmer Dave, right? No, actually oh. it is Riverdale Farm out of Groton. Okay. okay. Um, what do you think about something like this coming to uh, North Andover? Well, this is something that we've talked with Groundwork Lawrence about because you know it's so important for to because it's been so successful in Lawrence. How do you expand it to all the all the other communities? Because as Leslie mentioned, you know the borders are are just a line on a map, um, and the food food insecurity carries over to all of our communities. So, um, making sure that people have this access to fresh food, not just canned food or shelf stable food. That's great, but you know, our cultures, all of us on this phone come from, on this call are from different cultures. And yet every single one of us has a real tie to food and creating good meals and sitting around a table with family. And that is such an important part of who we are. Um, you know, the fact that people can't access food takes away a big piece of who they are. And so making sure that you're not um, just have a can of beans and and you know something in a box that you're serving your family is is not is not dinner that's just sustenance um so really making sure that everyone in all of our communities have this access is critical um and also in this pandemic we've really seen um the impact that supply chain the the issue of the supply chain so that the more that we can keep local is better um, where we're getting what we need from our local farmers and keeping them in business really helps if there's a disruption in the supply chain again or, or anything of that sort of big picture uh, situation. So, so um, are there any, Christina, are there any uh, legislative initiatives? Well, first of all, I'm going to back up to wh where would we bring it in North Andover? Would it be the farmer's market or? or? Um, it, it would be, it, we would, we don't have a lot of, we don't have the sort of same bodega culture no, in North Andover. You know, we have like the Richdale, the Quick Pit, Hockey, Mike's Market, you know, we have, we have a handful and, and, you know, they do try to have fresh food. They, they already try to serve some fresh food, but a lot of it is, you know, it's, it's cultural for us too, where our town culture, not <laughs> big picture culture, um, is a little bit different and you know less of that sort of city culture if you go to the corner store you know who who's serving you your food and um but you know there is a movement towards that especially again as the result of the pandemic people don't want to go to stop and shop and they don't want to go to market basket in the same ways they used to they want to go like i go around the corner to the butcher shop and i you know i'm one of five people in the store and i get what i need there and and leave so i think that's you know the movement for people is in that direction so i think it's actually a really good opportunity to try to expand this program mm -hmm. and we have been working with groundwork lawrence the delegation sort of the whole merrimack valley delegation has been working on this with groundwork to see how we can bring it to other communities with and haverhill also as well as andover and north andover mm -hmm. are there any um, other initiatives uh, legislative initiatives uh, are around food access in the Merrimack Valley in general? Well, I would say that one of the biggest um, programs is the HIP program, which is the Healthy Initiatives Program. That's at the state level, and that ties in with SNAP benefits. So SNAP, which people used to call food stamps, but it's, it's for it's SNAP is what it's called. Um, and it is a, that's a federal program. The HIP program layers on top of that, and it's only for Massachusetts residents. And it allows Massachusetts residents to shop with their SNAP benefits at farmer's markets. And so, and it gives, basically gives you between 60 and $83 a month of, of fresh vegetables at the farmer's market. And so it's a huge benefit. Everybody in Lawrence knows about this program, thanks to Groundwork Lawrence and the mayor's health tax. Everybody knows they have, uh, this is available to them. But a lot of people in North Andover still aren't aware that they can use their SNAP benefits at Farmer Dave's at the farmer's market on the weekend. They don't know they can do that. Um, and it really- but Now they do, thank you. But now they do. So <laughs> use your SNAP benefits at the Farmer Dave's. And it really stretches those dollars and, and it stretches it in a way where people 
you don't, you, you can't, you don't get a lot of money in SNAP benefits. Everyone has this idea that people are like getting fat off SNAP benefits. That's not the case. It's, it's a pretty small amount of money for a family, but you know, to get an extra $80 for a family to spend on healthy food is a big deal because they might choose to eat ramen instead to stretch their money farther. But if they know this $80 can only go towards you know, fruits and vegetables at a farmer's market, they're going to be willing to spend that money and actually bring healthy food into the home. So it really does make a difference. And that happens at the state level. Um, is one of the first things that Groundwork Lawrence came and visited me when I first was elected. I think within two months, somebody was sitting in front of me telling me, and actually as a North Andover resident, Ian, um, <laughs> he came in, he sat in front of me and said, I got to tell you about this program. <laughs> you need to learn how important it is to the people who live across your district. Um, and really educated me on how it allowed Groundwork Lawrence's farmers market to go from 80 some odd thousand dollars in sales to over $200,000 in sales just by the fact that this program exists. So mm -hmm. while it also helps people live a healthier lifestyle, it also helps our farmers be able to rotate to different types of crops and, and have a higher level of security that they're going to be able to sell the produ produce that they bring to the farmer's market each week. So it helps people and it also helps farmers. And, um, you know, again, it's one of those like two for one deals um, where we're stretching money farther and helping multiple areas of the economy and of the community, not just in these little silos. So, but it's a great program and it's constantly sort of, there's a constant threat it's going to be cut or it's going to be cut back, or it's it's never fully funded. Um, but over the past year, we've really gained a lot of traction and and pushed to just keep expanding it, not contracting it. Um, and then this crisis has really brought to bear this idea that we better be doing a really good job supporting our farmers and supporting fresh local food and just food in general because so many people are in need that we can't be cutting programs that help um, grow access. You know. And this is uh, such a crucial issue. So Vilma, Leslie, and Christina, we have a, a good listening audience looking at us right now. What, what if, if you could ask them anything to help with this program, or how can the day-to-day -day person listening to you right now who can see the benefit of how it helps all of us, um, what would you ask of them? I think that I want to ask not so much the everyday people or our small businesses, but rather people like our representative Minikuchi. I think that at this point, I mean, we were lucky enough to have a program ready and the funds came and it were able to quickly, you know, uh, implement it, you know, enter into contract with Groundwork Lawrence and, and MCCI. But I think that we're always struggling trying to figure out how we're going to fund this program moving forward because the need is there, yet it's a challenge, but we've seen the benefits. I think that we cannot uh, attribute the, the decrease in obesity rates in our city just to this program, but to a series of efforts and strategies that are happening across the city. But when you have a program, any of those loose uh, funding, it, it just breaks that cycle, right? It breaks that continu the continu uh, continuity. And um, I think that right now we're struggling to try to figure out how we're going to fund this uh, Bodega project moving forward. And I think that that was going to be my ask is how can we figure out a way to support mass emotion supports the policy change and the systems change, but not necessarily the actual um, initiative. So that would be my ask. And second, I think that we have done a great job um, at promoting the program just because you have people that understand the community, have lived in the community, understand the culture of those bodegas. I think that I will say anyone, to anyone, and I think this is something that to any small business should be, you know, we should raise the awareness around what it's available within the city. Come visit the Office of Planning and Development and learn more about what are the opportunities and what are the resources available to small businesses including the Healthy on the Block Bodega Saludables program. So that will be the two things um, that I will, I will ask. And people can get more information from you, Vilma. Absolutely. They can actually call me or call Alicia Miller. Alicia Miller is a coordinator for the Mayor's Cell Task Force. Uh, you can look at us, uh, look us up. Now we're going to be our website. The Mayor's Cell Task Force website is going to be under the city website. So you can look it up under www.cityoflawrence.com or you can call us directly 978 620 
3527. And that's Alicia's phone number. You can call me as well, 978-620-3526. Leslie and Christina, anything you wanted to add as far as speaking to the public around this yeah, issue? Absolutely. I would say, you know, I echo Vilma's um, comments, but I would say to you all who are watching, you know, as I said earlier, these issues don't stop at the borders. These issues are happening across our, um, our Commonwealth, across the country, across the world. Um, and by voicing um, your support of these concerns, by voicing your, uh, you know, concerns about them, by supporting the work that we do um, at the local, state, and um, federal level, we are able to be stronger. We are able to do more. So call your legislators, ask them if they're supporting HIP. You know, call your representatives, call your state senators. Are you supporting HIP? Are you supporting the work that's happening across the Commonwealth to make sure that our farms are being well taken care of and that it's not all going to large agribusiness? Are you making sure that, you know, our folks are being taken care of because they're not working right now and they need these SNAP benefits and HIP is a crucial part of them being able to have access to healthy food. And that goes a long way. Um, the more the representatives and the state senators hear from you, um, the more they're going to be open to these conversations and to being supportive of the work that's happening. Thank you. Christine. I would agree. I would agree. Those are really, those are really strong points because um, I know that if I didn't, if someone from Groundwork Lawrence didn't come and sit down with me and tell me about HIP and you know, my, my sort of business mind says, boy, that is a really great program. Like let's, we're stretching money. That's a great program and full buckets. And, you know, I sort of took that on as something that was important to me. And I went out and I shared it with my fellow legislators that didn't know what it was. And they were like, well, that's a no brainer. Why wouldn't I sign on to that? And so just getting people on board to become sort of champions of the food cause and then going out and having them tell two or three other people starts a chain reaction. And now there are more members of the food access caucus than there's ever been in the legislature right now. I think the entire Merrimack Valley delegation is now a member. Um, and so because it's one of those sort of, it's, it's a little tricky to understand at first, but once you do it, you realize it's a no brainer. And I think that, you know, for me, I mean, as far as my message to people is that if they're in need of, of help and accessing food to reach out to me in my office, I can help get them set up. But, um, you know, sort of breaking the stigma of SNAP, it has had such a, has a stigma attached to it from so many, just from years and years of people remembering getting white peas in a box with black letters. And they think that that's what they're getting. And it's not because we know that um, we need to give people freedom of choice and, op and the ability to choose what foods that they want for themselves and for their family. And so, um, you know, trying to break that stigma that, that this is there to help people and to help people be fed and to feed their families and to take care of their families. And um, unfortunately, there's still some hiccups on the difficulty in signing up sometimes. So, you know, that's what I'm here for. And there's lots of organizations in the Merrimack Valley that are more than happy to help people get signed up and and um, you know get the benefit of being able to shop at the local at, at local stores, but also at the farmers markets and getting healthy food for their family. So we don't want people going hungry. And so, if people needed a little bit of help, Christina, what number should they call you at? Nine seven eight five six six fifteen eighty. You can call Is me. That's Vilma's exactly. number or your number? That's me. <laughs> I'm only two. That's Vilma's number. No. <laughs> they can text me on that number. Um, and I'm always happy to help. And, you know, when people do reach out to our office about just about anything, we always hand out sort of information sheets that gives them information about how to sign up for SNAP, how to sign up for Mass Health, or um, to access food at any of the other locations all around the Merrimack Valley, whether it's in Lawrence, Haverhill, Methuen, North Andover, the different food pantries, food food delivery services. Um, you know, there's a lot of help out there, but sometimes people just don't know where to ask. And a lot of people are asking for the first time in their lives. And so, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's become a little bit, um, 
more common than it has ever been in the past. And so, you know, we, we always encourage people to ask the questions and, and we're there for them and we can help them answer questions they don't know they have yet. So <laughs> that's what we're here for. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just make one comment also because we were talking about borders and Vilma, you had said, uh, had urged people to come and visit the offices. I'm going to urge people to cross the border and I'm urging people to try and stop thinking about borders, mm -hmm. that we should cross those borders and start to build relationships among, mm -hmm. among the, a bigger we, let's just put it that way. And one of the things that I would love for people to do, and you can come with me and let's go visit and purchase mm -hmm. some good food at the bodega, some good healthy food, and maybe some unhealthy food um, <laughs> because they are good. And it, it's like going back in time. And what I mean by that, it's the warmth of human beings and family rather than going into some of these large big, big box stores and not that there's anything wrong with them, but um, local is so important and breaking down borders um, I, I was going to say more now more than ever, but it's always been the case that we have got to stop uh, looking at people as others and communities as that community or that community. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is by visiting people at a one on one level. I want to thank you all so much for taking your valuable time. And believe me, I know you're probably going to jump onto yet another Zoom call, right? <laughs> um, but thank you for joining Community Inroads Watch for the Helper series. Um, and I will be seeing you on the road, every one of you. Sounds good. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.